on salvage hunters. Drew meets a collector who simply won't let go. Is it for sale? Uh, no. Would that, is that available? Mm, not really. Is that for sale, John? Uh, it wasn't d destined to be for sale. He finds a statue that's finger-licking good. Could be Colonel Sanders. I mean, who knows? And he discovers a classic collection that drives him car crazy. Oh, my word. Look at all this. Drew Pritchard is one of Britain's leading decorative salvage dealers. Wow. Blimey. Look at this. He scours the country in search of weird and wonderful objects. I love that. Oh, that's a stonking one. Look at that. In his hunt for treasure... Is that marble or stone? He bargains hard. So two thousand. I've got to get a deal. It's in my nature. With help from Rebecca. I'd rather go. You drive me around the bend. Lovely. I'll just go downstairs and we'll sort out payment. And a team of renovators, he transforms thousands of items from junk to gems. At the headquarters of Drew Pritchard Antiques in North Wales, unusual objects of every type are being bought in Barton. Patched up, polished, pictured, and put online. David, that's great news. Yes. Rebecca is doing business with a regular customer. I've just been speaking to David, who is uh, a customer that we've had 10, 12 years. He's an avid collector of anything to do with royal memorabilia. If Drew comes back with anything... There'll be excellent sources of top-quality items. Uh, I like buying from collectors for lots of reasons. Number one is they've usually got the best stuff. They know the subject, and what happens is they don't buy one of the best. They'll try and buy ten of the best, and they'll have multiples. Drew's got access to one man's collection that grew so big, it's now a major tourist attraction. They're travelling from Condidno to Exmouth in Devon. We're off to see uh, Nigel and James at the Museum of Country Life. Um, this one looks like a good one. As with any museum that we go to, there is always about 30% of what they have in stock shoved behind the scenes, in barns, unrestored. That's why these places are always good for us. We always do well in museum. They're quite good days out as well. They are. Along the coast, the world of country life is a visitor attraction established in the 1970s by farmer John Lee. Though it's grown to include playgrounds and animal attractions, it started life as John's personal collection, driven by his passion for farm machinery and vehicles. Until it got so large, he transformed it into a museum in 1978. Today it's curated by John's son, Nigel, and manager, James Turner. The collection started in early 60s. The father used to go to local farm sales and see machinery that he'd probably sat on as a young child and he thought, well, oh, it's a shame to let it go to the scrap man. There are so many interesting things, so many bits and pieces, not just on display, but in storage that we don't have room to have on display. I'd imagine there's a few bits and pieces. Hello. Hi, Drew. Hi, Drew. It's Nigel. How are you? Very good. Hello, Hello Matt. Hi, Hi. 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 How are you doing? Well, this looks good. Fantastic. Yeah, this we've is got a good to... start. It, yes. yes. Very good. None got... for sale. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find something for you to buy. Come on in. Can we go and have a look, yeah? Cheers. First stop is the collection of farm machinery. Nigel and James are fitting it off with straight away. Good guys, and Nigel's a farmer's son, and I've dealt with a few of them. Farmer's sons like Nigel's are absolute buggers to deal with. They know the value of everything. They don't want to let anything go. They're really good at haggling. Oh, yeah, they're tricky. Up over the top here, this is like on a store of excess. That's excess. Uh, on this bit. Is that excess? Which bit? That one. The carriage. What, the carriage. Yeah. Not really, what, no. Re not really doesn't not mean... There doesn't mean no. James is more than happy for you to have a look at. Yeah. But it's not on display. Where's that? Um, just up here. Can we have a Follow look? Follow me, yeah. yeah. All right, so what we got up here, then? All sorts of everything. Yeah, bits of, yeah, odds and sods. That possibly for sale. Drew's beginning to realise that the collection could produce an extremely eclectic mix. As soon as I get up there, I'm seeing that they have exactly what I thought they'd have, which is loads of junk and sort of rubbish, really, that you can't do anything with, but really random bits. What about that Cadbury's box there? Yeah. Would that, can that go? Yeah, it will go. Well, can I, can I buy it? Yes. Then spot a really good 
uh, Cadbury's chocolates display stand. Now, this would have sat on top of a counter in a shop with all your chocolates in it, advertising, and he said, I'll have one of those and one of those, and they open the back and take them out. They're very, very popular. Definitely a resto project. What, so how much would that cost me today? Shame it's missing. One of the pieces of glass with Cadbury's on is missing. At the turn of the century, this glazed mahogany cabinet would have stood on a sweet shop counter displaying chocolates. With its acid etched lettering, sliding doors and green baize covered base, it could be worth around £500. Make me an offer. I've got a figure in mind. Oh, well, that's much easier. Just spit that out and we'll go... 200 150 I'm having a haggle with Nigel. I want to just see on the first deal which way I need to push him. Well, he's a farmer. They, you know, they will. They'll haggle over a fiver and they'll spend all day doing it. 175. 160. No. 165. You're getting better. I'm hard to get hold of and they're super popular. A few years ago, I, I was buying lots and lots of these things. And you know what? I'll carry on buying them, but they're getting very, very hard to find. What's that one say? Hovis Cycle, Cycle House. House. Never heard of that before. I've never seen a sign exactly the same. I've never seen Hovis Cycles. Early cycling stuff. Hugely popular. Massively collectible. Anything with cycles on sells well. The enamel sign dates from the early 20th century and would have been displayed outside guest houses used by cyclists where the bread was served. It could be worth around £150. What, what would you take for it? They're worth fair money, by the fact that you've said you've never seen one before. This time you make me an offer. Today's going to be long, isn't it? <laughs> I was going to see 75. 70. Done. Thank you. The size is great. It's not big. It's not going to go um, into retail or onto another trailer, that's for sure. It'll just go to an enthusiast for, their, for decoration. Nothing more. Oh, some letters. I always buy these things, but they, they're becoming very, very tricky to sell. Really, really good quality, these ones. They're always the best. That's nice. It's nice, isn't it? Do we want these, T? I don't sell? know how many have we got in the air. Now, these were our, your normal common or garden letters that would go on the front of shops. I'm gambling that there's some words in there. If there's some words in there, we're in the money. If not, I've got a pain in the bum to sell. The set of letters measuring 22 centimetres in height and made of highly patinated bronze probably date from the 1930s. As a collection, they could be worth around £250. I want to pay any more for them because we don't know what the word is. There's a few bent. Done. Happy. Marvellous, thank you very much. If I buy ten letters and can make one or two words out of them, it's much easier. It's one sale or two sales. Instead of ten individual phone calls, ten individual invoices, ten individual payments, one or two payments. Much easier, much quicker. Get them down the road, get them sold, on to the next one. There are many different collections here, including one that is right up Drew Street. Oh, my word. You're joking. <laughs> look at all this. So, welcome Blimey. to the Hall of Transport. Oh, look at that. Oh, yes, now you're talking. A car for life. That's beautiful. So, did your dad acquire all these? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Nobody told me this was here. I thought they would have a couple of clapped-out old bangers maybe up on stands somewhere for the kids to play on. What they have in here is... It's not rubbish at all. This is really good stuff. Passionate about motor vehicles, John built the collection over four decades. You got a Trabby as well. And Norton's. Ooh, could I, can I ask a really strange fact? Can I sit on that one? I haven't sat on one in years. Can I have a sit on Yeah, go on. Let, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Got a dampened fork, Springer front end on it. Lovely. Tighten up the suspension on that thing. Tightens up your, to your shocker. Imagine going to work on one of these. You <laughs> fatten your fag. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wonderful. It's some really interesting stuff around the back of here. Okay. The things that jumped out at me. And there's one in there that I think is a little bit more interesting than the rest, and it is the Super Shell in blue. So, I think it's interesting because it's Super Shell. It's not just normal Shell petrol. It would have been a higher octane rating. Illuminated glass globes carrying brand names would have topped each petrol pump on station forecourts before being phased out after the advent of self-service in the 1970s. This blue one promoting Super Shell dates from the 1930s and could be worth around £500. So what do you want for that one? It's, it's going to be down to Nigel, I'm afraid, for the, for the price. I reckon 
250. Salvage Supremo Drew Pritchard is at a holiday attraction in Devon, where the Lee family is driving a hard bargain over a vintage petrol pump globe. I reckon 250. Hmm. I was thinking 200. Want a bit more than that? We're not far apart. Well, 50 quid. Do you want to split it? If I have to. Don't have to. You're Two... the boss. <laughs> yeah. 240. Done. Marvellous. Thank you. Never seen a blue one. Is that right? Never seen one. No pressure tea. No. Don't break that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm really hoping is that I found something a little bit rarer than the normal, but I'm not sure. I've not seen one. I've seen lots of stuff, and I've not seen one of those, so fingers crossed. Drew's hopes of getting superior items from this collection have so far paid off. If the shell sign is as rare as he thinks, for him. How big is that the thermometer time. there? Oh, he goes all the way up to 140. What do you want for it? The more I look at it, the more I like it. That is a downside for you. The thermometer made of tin over a wooden base would have been on display on a petrol station forecourt, prompting customers to think about buying antifreeze. Dating from the 1950s, it could be worth around £250. This one's really nice. It's the first paint, never been restored, and it's still got the glass up the centre. It's not too big, and it's got no advertising on it. It's really nice and simple and plain, and that's what I like about it. I like it an awful lot. Make me an offer. Tricky one. No, go on, it's yours. You know your prices. You've been pretty much within 30% on all of them so far. No. No. I might on this, because I quite like it. I'm going to go 120. Sold. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to places like this is essential for me because it does fuel the business and gives us lots of really random, odd things that you wouldn't expect to find. I've seen thousands of these globes. They're hugely collectible. That one I can't remember seeing, so maybe we're going to get lucky. One thing I know we're going to turn a profit on is the Cadbury's cabinet. These cabinets tend to always go into private collections for people to put their own collections in. One of the other things that I really enjoyed buying today is the little round Hovis cycle sign. A really interesting find, you know, and that, with an interesting history behind it. The little bronze letters, we bought them fairly cheaply, £10 a piece, hoping that there's some words in there and then we were completely unrestored. We had a good bit of fun, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, it's been good. Sold a few things. I hope I was right on the price, but I'm sure Drew and T will uh, <laughs> make a few quid, which is fine. That was fun. It was great. Yeah. What a cool place. The thermometer is going to be the one that makes the most quick and easy money if I can be parted from it. Well, I think you soon part with it when I try and take your temperature with it. <laughs> On the way home from Exmouth, Drew's arranged to meet another avid collector and try to buy from his collection of arts and crafts furniture, one of the biggest in the UK. The lads are heading to the village of Painswick in the Cotswolds. We're off to see a guy called John Ashton Beer. He told me exactly that. They're still collecting. They never stop. They don't sell it very often. But what they do do is occasionally they overstretch themselves and they want to upgrade their collection so they'll sell off some other pieces. So all we've got to do is just get lucky and see if he's going to actually sell something to us. We've had a pretty good month. I'm in the mood for a big spend. We need to up the stock level and I only want to buy superb stuff. I'm not interested in anything else. So not the normal tap we buy then? <laughs> no, tea. Thanks for your continued support on that as <laughs> well, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. In Painswick, a local chapel is now a museum full of rare arts and crafts pieces, which John Ashton Beer has spent his life collecting. It was a holiday job he had in his teens at a local country house that first inspired John's passion and turned him into an avid collector. Walking into their house, there was something I heard, never seen, and I needed to find out. Since that day, John has scoured the country for the very best of arts and crafts, and the collection is now bursting out of the chapel. Hello. Hi, Drew. How are you doing? Hi, Tate. How are you doing? Cool. Well, I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to get in. I can already see a couple of bits. It's already coming up. If we can squeeze in. Walk sideways. <laughs> Breathe in. <laughs> oh, wow. Today's going to be an education, I can see. This is going to be a busy day. Did everyone know? Have I pointed anything you want to know about? My initial thought walking through the door was... Wow, this is just wonderful for me. 
Jekyll? Yeah, there's Rowley Galleries. Yeah. Edward Borden. You've got a Madsman esque one over there. Yeah. It actually speaks of that. <laughs> <laughs> Arts and Crafts community. Anybody that mattered, there's a piece by them. You're leaning on one of the most important things. Oh, blimey, yes. That's not from... House of Parliament. Wow. By Putin. No. Really? Yeah. Came out of a 1930s bungalow in South London, would you believe? The Enormous Sideboard is by Augustus Pugin, one of the giants of Victorian Britain. His signature Gothic designs gave the Palace of Westminster its distinctive style. Pugin's ideas about the revival of medieval craftsmanship and quality of materials became the foundation of the arts and crafts movement. This, this is fantastic. This is the George Walton sofa. I bought off a pavement in Cheltenham. This original leather, original squab. Did he mark anything? Because I've never seen anything like Been in the collection for... 20 years. I really want that. It was in my living room. With every piece in the collection important to John, Drew's going to have a job to get anything from him. Is it for sale? Uh, no. Right. Would, is that available? Mm, not really. Is that for sale, John? Uh, it wasn't d destined to be for sale. I was going to use it in my house, but my house is a bit like this, but fuller. <laughs> <laughs> This Victorian ottoman, although badly in need of repair, is a quality piece with ebony inlay and marquetry corners on a note frame. It has diamond patterned string work across the black silk side panels and a needlepoint top. It could be worth around £1,500. Super original, lovely item, super quality, must have cost fireside piece of furniture. You know, you'd have your large fireplace, club fender, pair of armchairs, that in the middle, lovely. OK, give us a figure. Need some repair. I would be asking about sort of twelve fifty for it. I'd want to be buying it for, like, seven fifty. But, no. you know, that on the front there is, is, a, is an issue, isn't it? Yeah. What I would do, an obvious repair. Yeah. I think that would be then the that, way I'd go forward honest. with it. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Arts and crafts way of doing it. Exactly. <laughs> Eight. An ottoman is very much part of a country house look. They are now used predominantly to put coffee table-sized books on. They look very good in, the, in, in that way. They just do. But you want one of a certain height and size to give it. This is Lutchen's design. Wow. Originally conceived for the headquarters of the BP and for the Viceroy's house in India. Sir Edwin Lutchens, who designed the cenotaph, was one of the most influential British architects of the early 20th century. What about this? That's Lutchens again. Yeah, it's a copy. More the pity. Still nice, though, isn't it? Lovely thing. Is that for sale? Um... The chair is one of a pair, but they're modern reproductions, not originals, which may be why John is willing to let them go. Despite that, they are high-quality items, created in the 1980s by Lutchens' granddaughter, Candia, and could be worth around £4,000. Because of their age, they're made in the 80s, um... Yes, it reduces the price that they would be worth if they were period ones made during chairs, made by a Lutchens firm, made by a member of the family to an original design. So, yes, it takes the edge off, but they're still very nice. Architect-designed furniture, that's what they are. So, are these for sale? Um, uh, potentially. What do you want for them? So they're made by Lutchens... Granddaughter. Granddaughter, from a design by... Lutchens. From design by Lutchens... Um, the original design. I think this design is 1927. So how much for the pair? Well, I've been asking for two grand a chair. So, but I don't know yeah. where. No, I can't. We can't get in there. I'd be like 1,500 quid for the pair. No. Okay. If all is well with both, would you take two 250? Two and a half, and I. I'm going to be really, t really hard. Thank you. And uh, are you going to keep them? No, no, you will sell them, yeah. Drew's managed to prize some great gems from John's amazing collection, and he's hoping for more as they go upstairs to what was the balcony of the chapel. There's something I saw from the ground floor, which is right there, that pair of side tables. Tell me about those. I bought them from a photograph. Copper and black paint, they're wooden legs, and then... With a steel frame inside. Or is that copper? That one's got a lift-up lid, yeah. like a sewing table, and the other one's one of these discs open. That is just, just extraordinary. 
I turned round and I saw this pair of side tables, or bedside cabinets, whatever you want to call them, and I really like them. Even from here, I thought I'm buying those. Similar but not identical, the pair of side tables featuring simple raised copper roundels on a plaque around two thousand pounds. How much are they? They're very naively made with yeah. all the exposed screws. Yeah. Um, you know they are what they are. Yeah. But. I mean, I was asking four nine five each. Can I tell you where I'm at with them? Five fifty. Antiques empresario Drew Pritchard is visiting John Ashton Beer's superb collection of rare arts and crafts furniture. He spotted a pair of tables and he's trying to persuade John to let them leave the collection. I like them, but yeah. there's work there Six. and I will need to do the work. 600 quid. Yeah. So, thank you. This is superb piece of kit these are. These are really stylish. But again, paint, take it to the garage. Ruined. Please stop amateur restoration. Just stop it. Stop it. Drew has already spent nearly £4,000, but he's seen something else in John's collection that he finds irresistible. There's these as well, John, I saw as we were wandering in. I didn't want to jump on them straight away. Tell me about these, because there's another one over there. They're wood. Yeah. They're petrified. Yeah. Buried for millions of years and now turned to stone. Terrified wood. <laughs> Ter Terrified. Petri petrified wood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a tree. <laughs> it's so heavy. The most amazing grain. You can see the grain on that thing. Oh, God. Just amazing. People use them, you know, have them by the end of a sofa and you rest your wine glass on them. And you, you can't spoil them. Petrified wood is effectively a fossil created when the original tree is buried by sepulchre of the tree. These objects are millions of years old and the pair could be worth around a thousand pounds. They're very desirable and they also get, go down the sort of natural history route, which is always attractive, always sellable, has been for years, hundreds of years in fact. Well, how, how much are they? Well, they were going to be about a grand each, but half of that to you. How far away away? It's a... They, weren't, say, a, they say, weren't a steel. You know the age to them. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest, about, about three million years. Yeah, the oldest things I own. <laughs> They are proper tree wood, isn't they? They are proper tree wood. Proper um, tree wood I see them at 350 quid each, and that's really 700 pounds. Um, so that's where I'm at, and I'm going to stick on it. That's where I'm going to stay. I can't move. You've called it a deal. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. T, okay. I apologise in advance. <laughs> you to carry them. <laughs> point top, and a second one in need of almost total restoration. He also buys a pair of wooden chairs with leather upholstery, spending a total of nearly 6,000 pounds. Today was interesting, exciting, informative, and very profitable. Bought some fantastic pieces. Those Luchin's chairs, great ones finished. I've got some exciting things, you know? That pair of metal side cabinets, love them. It was like World of Ottomans today, wasn't it? How many did I buy in the end? Three? Very happy with them. One of them is exceptional. One of them is really good. Not just a bit good, this is superb piece of kit. It's always good to come to collectors and museums because they don't just buy everything and go, I've got everything now, and stop. They don't. They can't. They're collectors. They can't help themselves. They want more things. They find another... another oh, I've heard of another piece there. It's better than this. They I'm always sad to see things go, but... I always like when I've got someone enthusiastic who wants to buy. In some cases, Drew might be um, using them in his home. Another thing, he'll be finding a buyer who's going to be equally enthusiastic. That was just fantastic. I am shocked I was able to buy anything. I didn't think he'd sell a thing. It was incredibly interesting. And then you bought something that hadn't been that had been designed by nature. Two two items. <laughs> the two street stumps. Yeah. They are extremely interior design friendly. Yeah, they're lovely. You know how the process of petrification works, don't you? No. First you're afraid. <laughs> then you're petrified. It's a long drive back to Clandidno, where the team are waiting. And it's the group of pieces that Drew brought from John Beer's Arts and Crafts. I say. Good. Fabulous. I mean, he had an amazing collection of arts and crafts, and he wouldn't really sell most of it. But what I did buy was just exceptionally good. Super Ottoman. Whoa. Ready to rock. Drew's come back, not with just one Ottoman, but three. And this is That's fabulous. Unusual. That's my favourite. I like that. It's, yes, it's perfect. That is absolutely That's dead right. Up. My favourite has to be the one with the black silk sides and the crisscrossing. It's just lovely. And I'm not into Ottomans at all. They're not my bag, but I'd buy that one. 
These are very handsome. Yeah, great. Handsome's the word, yes. So they were designed by Sir Edwin Lutchins. The first impressions of the Lutchin black leather armchairs was, oh my God, they're stunning. The shape, the form, the cut. The tapestry ottoman has gone into Alex's joinery workshop to have some chipped veneer restored. So we're looking for some oak which is thick enough to be an original repair. And also it's got to have the right colour and the right grain. Veneer is a thin top layer of wood. First, the old section has to be removed and the new piece cut to size. So we've got our two patches of veneer cut now. So we're going to apply our glue, we'll let that set, and then we can sand them to a more delicate shape. A little bit of filler is smoothed into the bottom of the foot. We've had a bit of a hard life, and where they're rounded off, we're trying to veneer up with a nice, sharp, crisp shape. Just need to tidy that up a little bit. Some wood stain darkens the new veneer to match the rest of the ottoman. We're going to have to build up a few layers just to get it right. So now we'll see. it looks original, it looks aged, so I'm really happy with them. I think that's spot on. Next, it's over to Craig to repair the upholstery where it's worn away with age. This will be the honest, straightforward repair Drew discussed with John. The first step is to cut a strip of black canvas fabric. He pins it in place. Folding over the edge, skewering, and we're lining it up just underneath the edge of that cord. Using a small gauge curved needle and a light thread, Craig hand sews the new piece into place. Then finally, the skewers come out. Yep, as good as new. There's one more collection Drew is keen to see. He's making the long drive from Clan Didno right across the country to this in Nice Man, but also a very well respected antique dealer, Robert Barley has a very individual eye and does that rare thing of buying exactly what he likes with not a second thought to what anybody else thinks. Drew's got privileged access into Robert's house to see his own personal collection of antiques. But what I promise you it will be a very, very random and different mix, whatever we buy. That's, that's for sure. The ancient market town of Dis is set around the edge of a large and extremely deep lake. Nearby, an accumulation of quirky items is overflowing from the home of Robert Barley, a man widely regarded as antiques royalty. As well as being a dealer, Robert has been a lifelong collector. This will be a rare opportunity. It's the object and it's the history of the object which appeals to me more than anything. I'm not really a businessman who's been in this to make money. I buy and sell things which I enjoy. I only buy things which I personally like. Robert. Hello. Hello, mate. Nice to see you. Hello. How, you Hello. How do you do? Yeah. Oh, this is tea, Robert. Tea. Come, come on in. Can have a look inside. Do come through. So, what have we got in here, then? So, God, well, oh, it's lovely. Some of this stuff has been sitting around, not being shown for 20 years. First time I've been into Robert's home, walk into the dining room, and it's... It reminds me a little bit of my house. It's, uh, you can tell you, you, there's a certain edge to an antique dealer's home, ever a natural way of throwing things together that look great. It's warm, homely, and the stuff in here. I did Drew in to dispose of some of his collection and make room for new things. It's not rude as a dealer to dealer to say, how much is that? No, it's not. Um, the, um, the bust here is absolutely beautiful. There's a little bit, a tiny bit of nicking on the ear. That can be 750. Okay. Nowhere left for me to go on that one, I'm afraid. So, no, I, uh, there probably isn't. But too um, obelisk. Are they period ones? I, I don't should imagine they will be. I, I imagine they're probably not. No. Um, I think they're not. This. There's a pair of uh, fossil marble obelisks of sort of quite a decent size. So I've not seen any in that sort of brown, muddy colour, which usually doesn't sell very well. But I think with a, a, a clean and some polish over those, they'll look really different. And the colourway's good, actually. It's different. The matching pair of obelisks is actually Victorian and could be worth around £300. <laughs> Are they? They're fossilising. And um, those can be 100 the pair. 100 the pair? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I'll have those. Just they're so nice, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Some wax or a bit of cleaning. Yeah, yeah. Great. They look beautiful. The obelisks are very much 
the English country house aesthetic. The natural history was very much part of that. They would have tables set out with different uh, fossilised remains, and it was to show that they've travelled and they understand this and they're very ahead of the game. It's very much part of that look, of that ethos, of that interior. Oh, I love this room. living room. Look at that. That's fabulous. Yeah, it's a bit uh, that's chaotic. Lovely. We've now come into the sitting room, which is just gorgeous. Just want to pick the whole room up. It's places and bits of this, that, and the other. It's just lovely. It's so comfortable. As usual with me, Robert, there's something that I can't have immediately that chair. The chair? Yeah. The chair's lovely. Um, it's all needlework. It's, it's, it's in very shabby condition, yeah. as you can yeah. see. Yeah. It needs a bit of TLC. Well, yeah. It needs sort of conserving, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's a 19th century one, not an 18th century. First thing I see is an upholstered, well, carpet and red velvet upholstered armchair. Lovely, really good shape. All in all, a very good English tapestry armchair with some red velvet on it. Lovely. The armchair is upholstered in tapestry, showing a floral design and edged in very worn red velvet, which has also been used to cover the frame. With a tasseled fringe along the bottom of the seat, the late 19th century piece could be worth around 1,000. And I really like it. Yeah, that is 650. Salvage entrepreneur Drew Pritchard has been given a rare invitation to the home of antiques luminary Robert Barley to browse through his collection of thousands of rare pieces. And he's fallen for a very worn tapestry chair, which Robert has had for 20 years. Had a repair on there. Five and a half? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Happy. Wonderful. Good, good, good. Sorry, mate. I think I've probably just bought your chair, haven't I? No, I think they very rarely sleep on that one. The chair looks really beaten up. It looks terrible, doesn't it? It's not that bad. If we can get that upholstery and the tapestry and the house piece. Robert's collection is full of unusual one-off pieces. And this, this is great. Right. It's Johnny Rice, isn't it? A lovely puppy. We had leather to there, redo yeah. the leather there uh, because it had perished. It's a nice puppet, and I want 200 for it. Oh, God, don't make that so viable. It's strange, because what I like about it is what's missing, which is probably the rest of the puppets. Imagine what they were. There was probably several skeletons. You can imagine them all dancing, you know, in a big sort of puppeteers and candles going off and children screaming. <laughs> That's what I like about it. There would have been a whole set of these things and they would have been doing crazy stuff. The skeleton has been a character in puppet theatre all over the world for hundreds of years. This carved wooden papier-mâché puppet, which probably dates from the 19th century, could be worth around 400. That's me. I have to have it. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. OK. Mm. <laughs> I shouldn't miss him. It's just a bit of fun. And it's got a nice bit of age to it, too. £200, probably all its money. I might make 50 quid. But it's it's fun and it's interesting and it's different. Uh, and it's highly original, bar some small repairs that Robert's done, which you could never tell. Um, so I'm happy with that purchase. Wonderful. I just absolutely love your buying. Oh. It's just a wonderful, wonderful mix of objects. Uh, it's a jolly nice thing. Yeah. That's 80 quid, that one. I love the painting of the girl. It's so I know, odd. It? I know, I know. It should be upstairs. I've got a doll which matches it. But it's just slightly... Menacing child. It's slightly sinister. Uh, I, not for sale. This it is. Ah, um, I want three, real three, yeah. 300 There's a it. real dealer there, isn't there? The unframed picture of a little girl is oil on canvas. Signed A. Weston and dated 1949. It could be worth around £300. The... Um, young girl painting. What can I say? I'm glad she's not my daughter. Terrifying. What, you know, that, that child looks like, it's like, just strangled the puppy. Yeah, it's got that sort of menacing look about it, and it's also very well put together. It's a very nice composition. To make the most of the bargain, Drew's going for a joint deal on the painting together with the small brass bets plaque. And you said £80 for the little surgeon thing. For this? Yeah. Yeah. Nicely done. Would have been on a big box where, you know, he probably carried it around, you know. Cow. So, a nice piece, a fun piece. Can we do 350 the pair? OK. Yeah. Sold. No. Wonderful. Thank She's you. so menacing. <laughs> now that Drew's been right round the house, it's time to look in the garden. 
Robert's collection is so vast that he's had to set up extra storage for overflow in a couple of large shipping containers. Nothing. The only thing that I do does take my fancy is the old, the old gent over there. Yeah, he can be 900 pounds. One thing we're walking around, and I can't take my, my eyes off it, is a huge plaster statue over there. Now, I think it's of Moses. It's 20th century, early, and it's not particularly rare, but there wouldn't have been many produced in that size. The two-metre-high plaster statue has been overpainted at some steps. Is it Moses? I don't who know is who it? it is. I'm not sure who it is. It's not too bad, is it? No, it's just great, isn't it? Easy, isn't it? Yeah. Tea. I'm apologising in advance. OK. Um, I'd like to buy that, please, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll go in the van. Well, no, yeah. It should do. <laughs> I don't know who it is. I think it's Moses, isn't it? It might be Moses, yeah. It looks really Could good. be Colonel Sanders. I mean, who knows? And I thought, he's going to ask about two grand for this. So I thought, well, maybe if I can get it for anywhere just under that, I'd be, you know, happily buy it. £900. Fine. Taking that home. It's big. It's unusual. It's got a great look about it. Um, and it's different. It's time to see if that enormous figure of Moses fits in the van. Today was really enjoyable. Best buy of the day and the thing that's going to spend the most money for us very, very quickly with zero restoration whatsoever is the large plaster cast statue of Moses. One of my favourite buys was the tapestry armchair with the, all the red velvet and silk all over it. Great looking, great shape, nice and original, never been touched by one repair. Fun item today, the puppet, couldn't resist it, 200 quid for a great piece like that. Very original, lots of fun. Robert, I would say, is somebody that I would always be looking up to in the trade. Today was wonderful. It was an absolute delight uh, to do business in that way. It's the following day when they finally make it back to HQ. Speak to Robert Farley. Oh, how is he? He's lovely. To be invited into an antique dealer's car. Oh, I love it. Isn't it fabulous? It's like Carl's passport for. <laughs> <laughs> It's lovely to have quirky items like the puppet. If you just sort of splatter those across our website, it just changes the whole look. And it shows that, OK, we're serious, we're in business, but we also like a giggle. So another velvet um, armchair, velvet tapestry covered armchair, 19th century. Yeah. The colours are glorious, mixed with a little bit of sort of grime that we're hoping we can sort of lift out. But, yeah, really good looking. This is great. Wow. Gav, don't take a chance with it, OK? Watch the head on there, watch the head. There's lovely sort of faded colouring paint marks on his sort of robes. But it's fantastic. The theme of putting a statue in your house. They sort of shouted, oh, bottom of my garden. But no, statues now have pride of place in people's houses. The armchair from Robert Barley goes straight to Craig for a spot of TLC. After flipping it over to revitalise the padding and springs, he puts a brand new piece of Hessian fabric underneath. We've got the seat built up again now. We've replaced this piece that was all ripped, uh, sewn the cord on that had fallen off. Using a curved needle and wax thread, he sews the cord under the seat back into place. A quick blast of steam lifts the dirt and grease from the arms, bringing out the original vibrant colour of the tapestry. That's all right. Because the restored chair is snapped up almost immediately by a cool young interior designer in London's Camden Town. The skeleton puppet hanging on a new frame custom made by Carl is just the thing to give a touch of style to a celebrity chef's new venture in Singapore. Drew's hunch about the rarity value of the blue super shell petrol globe from World of Country Life pays off. Worth 25% more than an ordinary white one, it zooms off the shelves. With enough bronze letters to spell boy and son, among other useful words, they sell as a single lot. And an antiques enthusiast in East London takes an instant fancy to the brass vet's plaque to set off her original 1960s habitat chest. 